Welcome to the City Impact Church podcast. Join us weekly to listen to sermons from our Sunday services or our special events. For more information, visit cityimpactchurch.com or find us on our Facebook page. We pray you'll be inspired and challenged by this week's message. Welcome, welcome all our campuses. It's great to have you with us. Welcome if you're watching on live uh, stream. We just want to pray that the uh, uh, Spirit of God would reach out through the airwaves and touch you as uh, he is here in our auditorium today. And so it's wonderful to gather together unto him. Can I hear an amen to that? Uh, junior high, I know it's a long weekend. If you, you got junior high today, I'm not sure. Thanks, Nick, you have. So that's cool. Um, you know, while the team have been away, uh, when I say a team, it was more of a group, obviously, 160-odd people, and some are still away. But I've been doing a series uh, and, and kind of bringing it back to Israel, uh, to where we came from. And uh, talking about the tabernacle to enter God's presence, particularly in relation to David's tabernacle. David's tabernacle in relation to worship. I believe God is restoring and has restored worship around the world uh, through Scripture and song back in 1969 from New Zealand. Uh, the gospel will go to the uttermost part of the earth and it won't return void. And then, of course, uh, in more modern days with Hillsong and different things, you might say, well, that's Australia. But, of course, Brian and Bobby came from New Zealand. New Zealand's the furthest place from Jerusalem. And so we're talking about praise and worship going around the world from this uttermost part of the earth. And David's tabernacle was all about praise and worship, right? Hello, you out there today? And so we've been talking about that and the rest around where we are on God's calendar just before Jesus returns, right? And so you're welcome to watch uh, the, those clips on our website. Check it out. And I know they'll be of great interest to so many people. In fact, I was just uh, texting Jonathan Kahn. I'm trying to get him out here. He's just released a new book called The Oracle, which is pretty cool. And uh, so he's obviously a bit more of an expert than I am on these things, being a, a messianic Jew. But in any case, I want to talk this morning and um, hope and pray that you would just be so inspired as I'm inspired to preach uh, this message. I, I love preaching to myself. Um, I'm not looking in a mirror, but I am looking in a mirror, a mirror dimly, uh, but I am looking in a mirror because I love to preach to myself as much to help other people. Jesus said in John 4, 23, but the hour is coming and now is. Everybody say now. I said now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. Of course, He's speaking to the woman at the well. She's saying, do we have to go uh, to Mecca? Do we have to go to this mountain or that mountain or take a trip to Israel today? What do we have to do? And Jesus said, no, the Father is seeking those who worship in spirit and truth. Whether you're in New Zealand, Tonga, wherever you are, <laughs> to worship Him. That's why, of course, can I just say, please, Wednesday night prayer is so important because we get a little bit more time to worship. Amen? We get a little bit more space uh, than what we get on Sundays in our short time and even our two-hour prayer meetings once a term. They're so important. The Father is seeking that kind of worship. Ephesians 3. Let me go there as I begin this morning. Ephesians 3, verse uh, 8. To me who am least in all the saints, the Apostle Paul speaking, this grace was given that I might preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. Look at verse 10. Now look at verse 10. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by who? I got four people that are with me today. Now, I just preached in chapel. I just prayed for a lot of people. I'm older than most of you. And you can't even say a word? Come on now. May know them by the... Thank you very much. I need all the help I can get this morning, all right? My darling wife's in Mount Wellington, and she's not on the front row to cheer me on. Just her own voice is enough for me. But when she's not here, I need you. Right. May know him by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Wow, wow. According to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. That verse 10 is incredible. I want you to think for a moment what the apostle Paul is saying here, that the manifold wisdom of God, God thought it out, he planned it out, might be made known by you and I to the principalities to the powers, I'm talking about angels, I'm talking about demons, I'm talking about archangels. 
Have you ever seen an archangel? Have you ever seen a de- just an ordinary angel? A common garden variety type angel? I haven't. But an archangel, that's, that's a whole nother level, right? We'll talk about it in a moment. But the powers and principalities, I want you to think about this in Revelation 4.8. The four living creatures, <laughs> this is uh, another lot up there in heaven, each having six wings, full of eyes around within. They do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Now, you could imagine. Here's these amazing creatures. 24 hours a day, seven days a week for eternity. <laughs> holy, holy, holy. Wow. Holy, holy. Oh. Do they modulate or not? I don't know. But you might say, well, how boring is that? See, you don't understand God. I said, you don't understand God. He calculates the dust of the earth. He numbers a grain of sand on the seashore. He knows every hair upon our head. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. No man has seen God and lived because his face is brighter than the sun. Even Moses, who spent 40 days in the presence of the Lord twice, He couldn't look upon the face of God. God had to put his hand over his face and just pass by, and he saw his aftermath, and his face shone so much that he had to wear a veil, got Moses' face. And so God is is unbeliever. Do you know the galaxies that God has created? The incredibleness. And so these angels are just crying, holy. Every time they look up, they see another aspect. You know, one day, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we'll behold his face. And we shall be like him. Do you know that was a temptation about Adam and Eve? Eat this and you will be like him. Wow. I want to think about that for a moment. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever, cast their crowns before the throne. And that's what we're going to do according to the book of Revelation, saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power for you, creator. See, when you have an understanding, even a limited understanding, even looking through a mirror dimly of the awesomeness of God, you cannot help. For by your will they exist and they were created. Now, these angels, 24-7, I think they had that song down pat. I mean, you know, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Back in the 70s, we would sing that 20 times through. We knew that song. But this song, I think they didn't need to have a practice. I think they, they, they never missed the right key, the right timing the drums, the bass, or whatever. It's like they were born to worship. Every time their eyes opened, it was like, oh, holy. They saw God in all of his glory. One day you will as well. But they couldn't help but worship. And it's like they were, yes, maybe programmed to, but they were in the presence of God. They beheld God face to face. Now, there are three top archangels. Angels. There's Michael, the warrior, Gabriel, the messenger, and Lucifer, the shining one, the worshiper. Now, if Michael ever turns up in your bedroom, freak out. Uh, he just takes people out. He's the one who wanted to fight with the devil over Moses' body. I mean, he just takes people out. If Gabriel shows up, he's probably got some good news for you. Here's the one who showed up to Mary and so forth. Lucifer, see, a lot of people think the devil's got like a, you know, horns and, and uh, you know, red suit with a big tail and so forth. But he was an archangel, a beautiful creature. We're going to read about it. Ezekiel describes him as a musician of musicians. He had music in his bone. I mean, I, I, wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be racist if I was to say he obviously wasn't white. I mean, he had music. You know what I'm talking about? Rhythm band. I could talk more, but I won't because I could upset somebody. But he, he was created to worship. Music was within him. And listen now, no wonder music is such a tool of the devil. See, some of you listen to the wrong kind of music. I have to confess, I turned my radio on yesterday to, to listen to something. And... Uh, 
they were playing Maggie May. Rod Stewart. I could sing you that song right now. Haven't heard it for a long time. But I knew that song. And it's a naughty song. It's a bad song. I had to turn it off. And then even then I couldn't get it out of my mind. Wake up. Okay, I'm not going to sing it. I had to play a worship tape to try to fill my mind with something else. But the devil uses music because he's a music maker. Let's read Ezekiel 28. Thus says the Lord God, talking about Lucifer, you were the seal of perfection. Wow. Full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. And it goes on to talk about the stones. And they are the same stones on the high priest's garments, Aaron. And they are the same stones in the book of Revelation that are covering the church. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes were prepared for you on the day you were created. God created all the musical instruments for the devil. He created the pipes, the bass guitar, the drums, I mean the snare. He had it all there for him. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. Think about that. You were perfect in all your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. Wow. Isaiah 14. How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. Talking about the devil. How you were cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. Weaken the nations. The Bible says that people are going to laugh when they see. <laughs> for, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt, pride comes before, for, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, on the further sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. I will be like the Most High. Adam, Eve, eat this, you'll be like God. In a moment and twinkling of eye, we will see him and be like him. Yet you'll be brought down to Sheol, to hell, to the lowest depths of the pit. Now, we know from Scripture that one third of the angels rebelled and were cast out with Satan. That's, that's a lot of angels right there because there's countless thousands of them, right? You know the story of Elisha? Open my servant's eyes, Lord, because he's worried about a, a few soldiers and the hills were filled with angels. And so one third, I mean, imagine losing one third of the church on a Sunday. I felt a bit like that, you know, with so many people coming and going over Israel and Turkey and long weekends and all that kind of stuff. They say even, even a, the best church in the world loses 10% of people a year. People come, people go for all kinds of reasons. That's why as a church, you've got to grow by 20% to grow by 10%. But can you imagine one third? And I think next day when they woke up, if they do wake up, angels, there would have been a different sound in heaven. Why? Because for the first time, the angels that stayed had a choice. Choice is a powerful thing. You and I have got a choice. Choose this day whom you will serve. And, and these angels had a choice. They had chosen to stay. They had chosen to stay and chosen to worship. Now, now God, and this is hypothetically speaking, he's, he's, he's thinking, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I want to show the devil something. I want to show the angel something. I am going to go down to earth. I'm going to get the lowest thing, the dirt of the earth, the dirt. And I'm going to make a creature called a man. You know, if you boil your body down, it's about 20 cents. All the minerals of the earth, that's what we're made of. And God said, I'm going to breathe into him. He's going to become a living creature. He's going to become a worshiper, a worshiper in spirit and in truth. I'm going to teach these angels really what it's all about. And so he created Adam. But guess what? Over that same thing that you will be like God, even though, listen now, Adam saw God face to face. He walked with God in the garden. Adam never knew pain. Lucifer never knew pain in heaven. He never knew loss. He never knew sickness. He never knew stress. 
He never knew what it was like to have the All Blacks lose. I mean, he never had that sort of thing, but, the de- the, but Adam, just like the devil, he fell. And of course, man has been spitting out the seeds of the forbidden fruit ever since. And so here was the angels worshiping in heaven. But guess what? Angels don't get tired. Angels never have a depressed day. There's no depression in heaven. They've never been ill. There's no sickness in heaven. They've never been in pain. There's no pain in heaven. They've never been through a divorce. There's no marriage in heaven. But let's be honest this morning. I'll be very honest with you. I know some of you have experienced pain. Some of you have experienced loss. Some of you have experienced a depressing kind of a day, occasionally. Some of you get tired. But guess what? You've chosen to stay. You've chosen to be in the house of the Lord this morning. You've chosen to worship this morning. You've chosen to worship God today. Hallelujah. I know that some fall out along the way, but you and I are here today to declare the faithfulness and the goodness of God. I've never seen God. I've never even seen an angel. I've experienced some loss. I've experienced some pain. I've experienced sickness. But enough to say, I've chosen to stay. I've chosen to worship. Now, the angels, they saw God. As I said, you've never seen them. I'm sure you haven't. And yet you worship. The angels have never been hurt. Young people, what happens when your boyfriend drops you? What happens when your girlfriend drops you? What happens if you go through a divorce? I mean, the problem some of you have, and yet you're here today, you worship. The angels go, wow, look at those people down there. Look at those people at City Impact Church. Look at those people around the world. Now, let's be honest. There are some things we don't understand. Hello? And yet we still worship. You see, I don't understand to believe. I believe to understand. And we do understand the power of worship. Because I put on the garment of praise for any spirit of heaviness. I know God comes and habits the praises of His people. So I can either worship the things of this world And I'm not just talking about singing a song. I'm talking about, as Josh said, with our money, with our time, with our energy. That's what worship is. And this last day move across the earth in relation to David's tabernacle, just before the coming of the Lord, is all about worship. Who will you worship? In a few weeks' time, in fact, next week I'm talking about the Queen and Sheba, but the the following week I'm going to talk about 666, the mark of the beast. It's all about worship, friend. It's all about who will you worship? Job is a guy who lost more than all of us. I don't even want to compare myself to his lot. But I want you to have a look at his life for a moment. Job chapter 1, verse 1. There's a man in the land of Uz. Sounds like the land of Oz, you know, Alice in Wonderland, but in any case. Whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, blameless and upright, blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also, his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, two Mercedes Benz. In fact, there's five Mercedes Benz and, and a couple of Rolls Royces and a jet plane on the side. He, I mean, mansion. Well, that's what it reads. Five, I mean, it just go, says that he is the richest man in all the East or the greatest man. But verse 5, people struggle when you bring it into modern day language. <laughs> okay. It's going quiet in this holy place because there's some religious spirits, I guess. They think poverty is next to holiness. But Verse 5 tells us that Job was a worshiper. In fact, it tells us that he would rise early. Here's a thought. He would rise early and worship. And he worshipped even though he was doing really well in life. You know, a lot of people who do well in life think they have no need of God. A lot of people come to God in hardship times. And I understand that. But it's great to worship God whatever you're going through, right? Because let's be honest, it's not that hard to worship God when things are going well. I mean, if I came up to you today and gave you a check for a million dollars, you'd go, praise the Lord. God loves me. Am I right? I mean, you may not say that out loud, but you'd be feeling really good. You'd be bubbling over. It's easy to thank Him when you have it all. Verse 6, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Hands up those who can understand that verse. 
you're a better person than me. Remember, Satan was cast to earth. I believe he was locked in water, trapped in ice. Superman had it right. When God separated the water from the land, that was a day he didn't say it was good. Why? Because Satan got released out of prison. He doesn't like water. We get water baptized. The devil walks in waterless places. The Bible tells us that. The day will come when he'll be locked in fire in the lake of fire. Probably this earth, because this is going to get all burned up. Poor greenies. I'm just saying. And so he's cast down, trapped. God wants to do something with man. He separates the water, creates man on the sixth day and all that. We talked about it. The devil wins the dominion of the earth back from Adam who had dominion. So Satan, the prince of the air, is walking back and forth across his domain. Job's living on this earth. Satan just wanders into heaven. I think it'd be a bit of tense moment. I think two-thirds of the angels would look over and say, what are you going to do, Michael? Remember Michael with the sword? Verse 7, the Lord said to Satan, <laughs> from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord. He said, I've been back and forth on my domain on the earth, walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, and this sounds like a setup to me. I don't ever want God talking to the devil about me. I'm just saying. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. You know what God's saying there, devil? You couldn't even stay faithful to me when you were in heaven. You saw me. Job has never seen me, and yet he worships. This dirt man that I created, this bag of dirt, he remains faithful. You couldn't do that in my presence. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household? Praise God for the blood around all he has on every side. You have blessed the work of his hands. His possessions have increased in the land. And the devil says, now stretch out your hand, God, and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you face to face. God won't do that, my friend. God is for you and not against you. And God could have said, hey, devil, you just shut your mouth. <laughs> Michael, come over here. And, but God had a plan. He said, I'm going to show you something, devil. So the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power, because it's a devil that comes to rob, kill, and deceive or destroy only do not lay your hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now, you know the story. In one day, you know they say if you wake up in the morning and there's not a white chalk line around your body, you're in for a good day, right? But this wasn't a good day. In one day, eight verses, eight miserable verses, he lost everything. And I'm talking about everything. He lost his stock. He lost his servants. He lost his Mercedes Benz. He lost his mansion. I mean, he lost his barns. He lost 10 children in one day. You know, can I just say to you right now, Satan doesn't really care what kind of car you drive. He doesn't care what kind of house you live in. What he is after is your breath. What he's after, who will you worship? Thank you, Claire. See, Satan is after what will come out of your mouth. And Job, he was a worshiper. It is a dangerous thing to be a worshiper. I tell you, if you're a true worshiper of God, can I just say, the world is not standing by clapping you on. I don't see too many people out there lining the street saying, whoa, and cheering like they did the All Blacks up in Japan, you know? I mean, they think you're crazy coming to church, giving your tithe, spending time here on a beautiful day, right? The world's not for you. The devil's not for you. And your own flesh is against you. <laughs> Hello? That's why you got to die to yourself, but you got to live. You, you're... And so it's a dangerous thing to be a worshiper, a real worshiper. I mean, if you want to listen to Maggie May and go with the flow, it's your choice. It's not hard to go down that path. It's a slippery slope. And Job, a worshiper who lost it, you could imagine the angels in heaven thinking, okay, what, Job, what is Job going to do now? Verse 20, then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head. 
My wife probably wish I had a shave this morning. He fell to the ground, and what did he do? I said, come on, what did he do? He worshipped, and he said, naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I will return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Wow, the angels are learning something here. We can learn something here. This was written for us. But the angels, they had never suffered loss. They had never suffered pain. They had never had suffered at all. But Job was still worshiping God. And Job was thinking, okay, I don't have a cow to sacrifice. I don't have a sheep to offer. I still have my health and I got my wife. But most of all, I got my breath. And I'm going to say, praise the Lord. In chapter 2, Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came among. Exactly the same scenario. Exactly the same. And the Lord sets Job up again. And he says, Job, still hold fast to his integrity, although you entice me against him, destroy him without a cause. It's basically saying, devil, have you seen that earth man I created? Have you seen that bag of dirt, that faithful man? You took everything from him, but he's still a worshiper. I created you to worship. I created you as a worship master in heaven. Yet you didn't remain faithful. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Okay, skin for skin, yes, all that he has, he will give for his life. But stretch out your hands. He, the devil's still trying to get God to do it. Touch his bone and his flesh. He will surely curse you face to face. The Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. Satan, you can take this man's possession. You can even have his health. But you're not having his breath. You're not having his breath. I breathed into man. Now, I want to teach. God's thinking, I'm going to teach the angels. Remember our verse in Ephesians? I'm going to teach them that the intent, the mysteries of God may be known by the church to the principalities and powers. I'm going to teach them about the sacrifice of praise. David said in Psalm, how can those who go down to the pit into hell praise you? The Bible says, let everything that have breath Praise the Lord. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Now, I grew up in the 50s, 60s. Today we have a bit of a measles ep epidemic and it's not nice and, you know, chicken pox and so forth, so forth. But when I grew up in the 50s, 60s, boils were quite common through schools. Anybody know what I'm talking about? About by people. But I, my, in my day, they called them the H-bug, I think it was. But uh, my mother used to lance them with a hot needle. If I told you how much pus comes out of a boil, I mean, they were painful things, man. We'd get them on our legs. I mean, most kids at school got, got boils. It was just like it was like a plague. And I know today, sanitation, that, I don't think they, they get them as much. But boy, boils are painful. Anybody here? No, I won't ask you to put up your hand. I just, I, I, I went first, right? But in any case, he had boils from the top of his head to the sole of his feet. And he took a bit of pottery, which to scrape himself. He didn't have a hot needle like my mother had. A bit of pottery to scrape himself, get all that pus out, while he sat there in the midst of the ashes. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Now, friend, I, I, I don't want you to be too harsh on Job's wife here. If you lost 10 kids in one day, how would you feel? You know, too often we can point the finger at other people. We don't know what they've been through, what they're going through. We should never point the finger and be judgmental at others. And you know, when you don't understand, when you don't understand some circumstance, you don't understand the situation, that's when you find out what you're made of. What am I going to do with a God that I don't understand? What are you going to do with a God you don't understand? His wife was mad with God, was mad with him. And then he has three friends show up. Now I have to say, with friends like this, who needs an enemy? These friends show up and just stare at him for seven days. Now I know in some cultures, I'll sit under a tree and just hang for a few hours. I would be bored after seven minutes. Anybody out there? Seven days without saying a word. And then one comes up with a great revelation. You're in sin, Job. 
Aren't Christians lovely? They always think there's something wrong in your life when something happens to you. You're in sin. That's why this has happened to you. You're going to be very careful on passing judgment on other people. Another friend says, you're proud, Job. Remember pride in heaven? You've been a hypocrite. And Job's sitting there in pain and agony. He didn't even get any sympathy. Boils scraping them in poverty. His friends turned on him. His own wife deserted him. It seems like God has left him. He's all alone and the whole world is against him. The only thing he had left was his choice. The only thing he had left was his breath. The angels are watching him. The principalities and powers that we talked about are taking notes. Satan thought, we've got him now. He's going to curse God and die. That's what happens when you curse God. He's going to fall. Come on, Job, bend the knee. Bend the knee to me. Bend the knee. We get to verse 15 of chapter 13. And Job, while in the condition of all these pain and agony and loss, while cutting himself with pottery to get rid of the, the boils, he says these words, Though you slay me, Lord, yet will I trust you. Though you slay me, Lord, yet will I trust you. I mean, God's saying, yes, that's my boy. The angels are gasping, the devil's groaning. This bunch of dirt, gone through all this, he's never seen God, he's never beheld his glory, and yet why is he trusting God? I don't understand it. He worships him in the midst of all that. You see, that day the angels learned a lesson in worship. The angels have never had to face a doctor's report. The angels have never had the stress of piling bills. The angels have never had the feeling of a, going through a, a marriage breakup or losing a child or having a rebellious kid. You see, what will you do, my friend, when all hell breaks out loose against you? Now, when you don't understand a situation... You know, I would never, ever want to go through Job, what Job went through. And I wouldn't even be in the same comparison. But you know, the last five years has been a rocky road. They say moving house is a stressful time. I have moved five times in the last five years. Not by my own choosing sometimes. I, I mean, we're trying to sell a house at Gulf Harbor. I was believing God, praying God. And I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll take a step of faith and buy a place on Borden's Road and, and we'll leave our house and it's going to sell. So I bought the place, moved down into there. I'd go up to Gulf Harbor. I'd walk around. I'd pray about it. I think two years went by. Never sold. I had to move back. Praise God, I did all right out of that place. That was all right. But that's not what I wanted to do, but I didn't understand. Then I had to move into a rental property, and, and I had to move out early, put place in storage. I lived in the city for a little while. Five times, they say moving is stress, but that wasn't the biggest stress in my life. I mean, I did that without, without blinking, thank, thanks to my friends helping me and so forth. I couldn't lift all that furniture by myself these days. I would have once, but... You know, in the last five years, I've faced two life-threatening situations. One, as you know, had a 100% blockage on an LAD. It's called the Widowmaker. You get 8 to 20 minutes to live. I lived for eight days with that. Flew home <laughs> from, from Panama. I mean, I should have died. Took me off a plane, an ambulance, a surgery. I, I went through that like a, like a knife through butter. Didn't worry me. I was happy. Witnessed all the nurses and Led some here, led, led people to Christ in the hospital, came back and preached next Sunday. I shouldn't have done it, but I did. I was off my face on drugs, hallelujah. <laughs> Should have recovered, but and then I faced something else, which only my wife and my surgeon know about apart from the nurse that walked in while I was laying on the operating table naked, and she said, hello, pastor. <laughs> <laughs> Embarrassing moment. It was life, life or death, eight-hour operation. You know, I have to confess, the next day I was feeling sorry for myself. I said, Lord, why? Why me? Why this? come through that, I know it affected me psychologically more than what I thought it would. 
last couple of years have been a bit rough. But then I had family things. Who's never here had a problem with your family? Maybe a couple of you got perfect families. I look at the Fullerton bunch. They're just beautiful. And got the Ironside bunch. We got, you know, the Grobler bunch. We got some perfect families. And, and of course, life is a long time. And hope it, hope it stays perfect. <laughs> I was doing pretty well. And so went through some family things. Never saw that coming. But you know, I've chosen to stay in worship. I've chosen through it all to trust in the Lord. I've chosen to be here today to worship God in spirit and truth. Even though I don't understand all things, even though I don't, I, I still put on that garment of praise. I will still give my best to God and worship in money, time, and energy. I've had people say to me, oh, you put the church before this and before that. I put God first. See, praise that costs the most counts the most. I said praise that costs the most counts the most. I like the words of St. Barton. St. Barton, a great man, he said, I'm hurt, but I am not slammed. I'll lie me down and bleed a while, but I'll rise to fight again. I hope and pray, my friend, irrespective of what you're going through, that you will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You won't camp there. Okay, I, I must admit, one day I was feeling sorry for myself. But it wasn't that bad. But it was a bit unusual for me. But enough to say that you've got to walk through these things and coming into a good place. So are you going to be a faithful worshiper of God? Are you going to be a worshiper in spirit and truth? Are you going to teach the angels on how to worship? Because angels are watching. God is watching. The devil's watching. What will come out of your mouth? What will come out? Oh, I could moan. I could groan. I could complain. Doesn't get you anywhere. Worries like a rocking chair. A lot of motion and doesn't get you anywhere, right? So, I mean, what are you going to do? Praise God. Are you going to curse God and die? Because that's what happens when you curse God. Or are you going to worship God and live? It's our choice. It's our breath. We've got to learn, church, to teach the angels how to worship. See, one day the trumpet's going to blow. The trumpet is going to blow for us, and either we'll play the music or we'll face the music. I want to close this morning. I hope you get something out of this. But the Apostle Paul, and again, like Job, he faced it all. No two ways about it. I love the heroes of old. Young people need to read about these people who gave so much for the cause of Christ living a different lifestyle. We do live in the ease of Zion, and that's our danger, right? Hello? I got one person cheering me on this morning. Thank you, Pastor Claire. I go to the top of the class. Hallelujah. But, but the Apostle Paul, he was imprisoned a few times. You remember the time he was in prison in the midnight hour? The midnight hour. Now, prisons, as you know, are not like they are today. He's chained in a cell. I mean, he's got rats running around. The food is, 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 is maggot infested if you do get food. I mean, you know, there's no toilets, no sanitary. And in the midnight hour, he, he's praising God, right? Hello? Angels heard. Why? Because an earthquake showed up and set them all free. Praise the Lord. And, and he could have moaned. He could have complained. I mean, hello? He wouldn't have understood that. But he, Paul had a greater understanding Let's have a look in Ephesians 3. This is another time he's in prison. I'm closing now. Therefore I ask you, for this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you. See, the Apostle Paul is not even saying, would you pray for me? I'm praying for you. According to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints. What is the width? See, when you understand the width, or just get an inkling of the width, the length, the depth, the height, oh, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you be filled with the fullness of God. Now to him who's, he's in prison writing this, now to him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we are, I think. I mean, it's easy for us to do it on our luxury boat, right? But here he is in prison, according to the power that works in us to him. This is just for us to be inspired by and to say, wow, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations. 
Remember what I said when I got up before? Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation or persecution or sickness or family things or shifted. None of these things can separate us. Come on now. I know you've been through some things. Some of you have been through way more than what I've been through. I mean, there's some things I haven't been through that you've been through. I've never lost. Well, I mean, I, I don't even want to go into the deal. You know your story. And I praise God that you're still here worshiping God, praising God. For some of you, I know it's difficult. Some of you went through things a few years ago, and some of you are just going through things now, and some of you may have some things to go through. What are you going to do? To Him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations. <laughs> Talking about us forever and ever. Amen. And then He says, Do not lose heart of my tribulations for you, which is for your glory. So, me just sharing my little bit of my little bit of story. Don't feel sorry for me. I mean, the thing is, is that don't lose heart of my tribulations. Well, if Pastor Peter drew, what hope is that for me? No. I could say it was for your glory because I'm a testimony. But I'd rather testify of the greatness of God and the goodness of God. And His, gra His grace is upon me to be able to go through what I went through. Praise God. I thank God that His, His hand is upon me. Hallelujah. I want to testify of the, the wonder of it all, the joy of it all. For the joy set before me. See, Job, as you know, he got everything back. We know the end of the book. Tenfold. You know, one of my favorite verses, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, Jesus said. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not tell you. But I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am you may be also. Do you know what awaits us, friend? See, if you want to hold on to the things of this world, But the things of this world will grow strangely dim. God will give you things just like he gave Job. Praise God. I live in a beautiful home now. I'm the envy of most people. Got a beautiful wife. Stunning. Even at my age. People think she's my daughter. I mean... God will give you things as long as things don't have you. What do you worship? What do you worship? Where are you going to spend your time, energy, and money? What are you going to give it to? I believe the time is short. I believe the days are short. I want to step up. I told my team, or well, just about four of them, the rest have all been away. Or two of them, actually. It's been a very, 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 very and Chris is away today as well, very, um, small exec meeting. I think there's been me and Krista and Joe, but he's away now. Well, he is away in Israel as well. I mean, there's been nobody around. I just got to talk to myself. <laughs> so I've been telling myself, Peter, it's time to step back up again. I'm through what I went through a bit. And so I want to give everything I've got for you, for your glory. I'm going to give it my best shot while I've got breath. The day will come and I won't have breath unless Jesus comes back soon, which I'm hoping and praying for. I was talking with Dino before and, and um, his uncle just dropped dead in the garden with planting the garden yesterday. Just, just, just dropped there, just out of the blue. He was at, um, sorry, at um, the, the funeral on Friday. And so in any case, I digress. But, you know, while I've got breath, I'll praise him. While I've got breath, I will give it my best shot. People say, why don't you retire? What do I want to retire for? Goodness me, look at me. I'm still young. Who'd want to retire? I've got no interest in going playing golf or spend my time playing bowls or anything like that. I just don't want to do that. I want to share the love of Christ with people while I've got breath. I want to praise them, give them my best shot, help these young people as much as I can and create a platform for them for the future. I'm excited. I'm very, I'm very excited. And so I hope and pray, my friend, this morning out of this message that you'd 
be that worshiper and spur in truth. I know, as I said, some of you have been through some things and you're here today, which is commendable. And I hope and pray that you'd remain faithful all of your life to love God with all your soul, all your heart, all your strength. Even when you don't understand things, even things, whatever. But angels are listening. Can I just give you verse 10 again of Ephesians? To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Oh, hallelujah. Father, we just want to thank you for the word of God. We thank you, Father, for what, what you're doing, what you've done, what you're going to do. Lord, we pray that City Impact Church would be a church that is full of worship, full of wonder, full of awe. And so, God.